scaffolding goes up around the fire-damaged swing bridge. Big price tag for a harbor remediation project. And a new lead in the Malaysian airline disappearance. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Well, nearly five months since a huge fire closed the James Street Swing Bridge, there is finally some activity taking place at this site. Work crews with Skyway Canada were on the scene today, but according to CN officials, they aren't quite ready to do any repairs. The workers have set up scaffolding under and beside the north end of the structure where most of the fire damage occurred. Around 10 employees were busy working along the underbelly of the bridge this afternoon, studying the scorched beams. According to CN spokesperson Lindsay Fetishin, this was simply a review of the bridge to start creating an assessment report. You have consultants working on the site. Scaffolding has been put in place to assist them as they are still in the process of conducting an extensive review and assessment of the bridge. There really isn't anything significant in terms of repair going on. They're still assessing the bridge and we are still waiting for that final report. We're expecting it to the end of March, so it'd be like not this Monday, but next Monday. Once the final report is finished and reviewed, the final steps will be shared with stakeholders from the City and Fort William First Nation Chief George M. Morisot. Morisot was not available for an interview today about the situation. The first of two public meetings was held last night regarding the cleanup of the north end of the Thunder Bay Harbour. Roughly 350,000 cubic metres of lake bed near the old Cascades Mill is contaminated with mercury. And local residents heard a number of options for addressing the environmental hazard. The proposals included different types of dredging and capping and were presented by an official with coal engineering. Many had questions about the various options with the main focus around funding. There is currently no plan for paying for any of the proposed options, but most likely the cost would be broken up between the government, the pollution contributors and the public. Each cleanup option varies in cost, but the range is between 30 and 80 million dollars. Would be slightly more ex expensive than excavation when you're taking the material away to a landfill. And that's because by excavating it, you're already isolating the material from the waters of the North Harbor. So you don't have to dewater the material as much to take it away to a landfill. The pro of the capping option is it's the least expensive. Um, the cons of the capping is it's quite difficult to implement and as well you are still leaving the material in place so you're into quite a bit of long-term monitoring. There is another public meeting happening at this hour at the Prince Arthur Hotel and that forum continues until 8 p.m. Well, the word nuclear can stir a lot of different emotions and so has the possibility of storing nuclear waste in our region. A handful of communities in the Northwest are in a learn more process for becoming a host site for a repository. But Green Party MP Bruce Heyer feels the consultation by the Nuclear Waste Management Organization has been lacking. He's now holding a series of meetings on the issue, including one in Marathon tonight and Nipigon tomorrow evening. Dennis Ward attended the first meeting in Terrace Bay last night and has this report. Bruce Heyer says deciding where Canada's nuclear waste goes is an unbelievably important issue. He's the deputy leader of a party that wants to phase out the use of nuclear power altogether. But he says he's still deciding whether or not he supports storing nuclear waste in northwestern Ontario. He's also skeptical of the thousands of jobs the Nuclear Waste Management Organization says will be created in a host community. There are uh, allegedly some jobs that could come to the, to the area. And uh, heaven knows we need those jobs in northwestern Ontario. Um, but it's a, it's a matter of a balance of trade-offs. We need to weigh those benefits to the potential liabil liabilities, and so that's why it's important that everybody have their say. Concerns have been raised about storing nuclear waste in the region. Even the transportation of the radioactive material, whether by road, rail or ship, is enough to scare some people. Scriber Mayor Mark Figliomini understands the concerns, but the economic benefits are huge, and that's one reason his community remains in the process. Oh, certainly. There's, uh, there's a lot of concerns. Um, 
I guess any time you throw the word nuclear in, into a, to a discussion, uh, there is going to be concerns. We're asking, like I said, our, our citizens to come out and learn more, and, and ultimately the decision will be, uh, will be in the hands of the citizens. This is a very difficult public policy issue, and people have many questions, uh, and people have concerns. Uh, there is a lot of misinformation that uh, is out there, uh, but, uh, you know, there are a lot of good questions as well. The NWMO says this is just the beginning of a very long process that currently involves more than a dozen communities. Any decision on a host location is still seven to ten years away. Dennis Ward, TBT News. It was another huge crowd today for the 8th annual Diversity Breakfast at the Victoria Inn. Around 450 people were there to celebrate the United Nations International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. This year's keynote speaker was a three-time Nobel Peace Prize nominee. Michelle Sufi reports. Violence and hatred, they are not taught, they are made. Dr. Izzeldine Abu Laish gave a powerful message at the celebration breakfast that left many in tears. He's a three-time Nobel Peace Prize nominee and the author of I Shall Not Hate, and his story is a tragic one. On January 16, 2009, Israeli shells hit his home in the Gaza Strip, killing three of his daughters and a niece. Instead of harboring hate and revenge, his response was just the opposite. He chose not to hate and live in the past. Life is what we make it, always has been, always will be. It's in our hand, not to blame others, but to take responsibility. Instead, he became a proponent of peace between Palestinians and Israelis. He has won many humanitarian awards around the world. Abu Laish says his message at the celebration breakfast is about hope. What world do we want to live in and what can we do when we all come together? It's a responsibility. All of the people should come together as they came this morning to work together for a better world for them. Diversity Breakfast co-chair Tina Tucker says it's important to hear a real-life story like Dr. Abu Laish's. Helps us all to be more empathetic, maybe more respectful, maybe more mindful of how we treat others, and that's very important. Also at the breakfast, Thunder Bay Police Constable Larry Baxter won the Respect Award for all the work he has done for the community. He says winning this award means they are making some progress. With the uh, committees that I've been working with, uh, Diversity Thunder Bay, the Hate Crime Working Group, um, it just tells me that uh, we're, you know, we're, we're making progress slowly. March 21st is the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Dr. Abu Laish says the first step for that to happen is by having people stop underestimating themselves. For a small action they do can affect the world. Rochelle Sufi. TBT News. An investigation into an alleged sexual assault in the city by members of the Ottawa University men's hockey team continues to move forward. Members of the Thunder Bay Police Service and the RCMP were in Ottawa last week as part of the investigation and they say while a large number of players and staff connected with the team are cooperating, some players have chosen not to speak with officers. The alleged assault occurred on February 1st while the Ottawa team was in the city to play the Thunderwolves and reportedly involved a lone female victim. The investigation is continuing and police say updates will be provided only when it is appropriate to do so. Well, more than three years have passed since a fatal collision between a car and a pedestrian on High Street. The hit and run trial for the driver in the incident has now wrapped up at the Ontario Court of Justice. Lawyers for 28-year-old Christian Hernandez and the Crown put forth their final submissions to Justice Joyce Pelche this morning. Hernandez is charged with impaired driving and failure to remain at the scene of the accident, which claimed the life of 45-year-old Richard Carmichael. The collision occurred on December 19, 2010 on High Street near the Van Norman Street intersection. Defense lawyer Mary Bird says Hernandez was not trying to avoid liability when he left the scene. She says he just thought he hit a deer until he returned home and realized that wasn't the case. Crown attorney Trevor Jukes argued that Hernandez was willfully blind to the fact that he had struck Carmichael before driving to his home on Shunya. The verdict is expected to be delivered on May 13th. The Regional Research Institute has welcomed their newest member of the team. She's earned medical degrees from Oxford and Harvard University, and she just happens to be from Thunder Bay. 
Dr. Nana Juma was greeted as the newest clinician researcher today. Described as one of the best and brightest in her field, the obstetrician and gynecologist returns to the city after years on the international stage. She says the Institute's high-intensity focused ultrasound was a big reason for her return. It's groundbreaking research in the treatment of uterine fibroids that no one else in this country is doing. It reduces a procedure that could be uh, require a three-day hospital stay and a six-week recovery at home to a one-day procedure in hospital where the woman can go home the same day. So it really can revol revolutionize treatment for women with symptomatic fibroids, particularly if they live in the region and need to travel or they can't take time off of work, don't have childcare. So it's a big advance in the treatment. Dr. Juma will also collaborate with Research Institute scientists on projects including Aboriginal women's health, substance use in pregnancy, and cervical cancer screening. The radio host on The Thunder is back from Antarctica after completing the world's coldest marathon in support of teen diabetes. Brent Hawley says fortunately the frozen continent wasn't the war was the warmest it's been in 15 years. But instead of ice and snow, he had to run through four inches of mud for 26 miles, which was tough going. He also had to deal with motion sickness from the boat ride from South America. There were no aid stations along the route, so injuries were that much more critical. And on top of all that, he ran out of water halfway through. It was the uh, it was the toughest marathon I've ever run. I've ever run a ton, but uh, the ones I have done, it was the, it was the hardest marathon I've ever run. Yeah, uh, all hills, mud, snow, puddles, like it was penguins, <laughs> all sorts of great things. Before I went, uh, Team Diabetes contacted me, asked me if I'd run the marathon for them. We had a bunch of events to raise money in the community leading up to uh, going down there. And we were fortunate, we raised about uh, $24,000 uh, for the Canadian Diabetes Association here in Thunder Bay. So all that money is going to stay local, which is fantastic. Next up for Holly is a marathon in Peru and then the Great Wall of China Marathon next year. Grade 7 and 8 students at Kingsway Park Public School were building skills today using less than conventional methods. The event, featuring Eric the Juggler, was planned to engage the students and get them active. In addition to learning how to juggle and street perform, an Aboriginal elder taught the students how to cook bannock. Kingsway Park officials say the circus arts fits into their school's curriculum for health and phys ed. But the bigger picture, according to Eric and school staff, is how these activities provide students with skills they can apply in everyday life. So chances are there's something somewhere that someone can do, right? Even if it's a hula hoop or the spinning plate or whatever. It's, the kids can get a minor success somewhere, which is important. It's life skills and it's building confidence and it's um, hand-eye coordination. You know, you, you can sit in a classroom and you can, you can learn the things that are strictly in the curriculum and you can forget them all the next week. But when you do something like this that's hands-on, that brings in your, your oral communication skills, your kinesthetic skills, your interpersonal skills, and you put that all together, it's something you can take with you all the rest of your life, not just for that school year. And it's, it's the confidence at this age that's so important too. Spackman says when Miller has worked with schools in the past, the students have been able to transfer those unique skills into other projects and school work. Well, spring officially arrived as the mercury hit just above zero this afternoon. And according to Environment Canada, this was the coldest winter in 35 years. And there's no doubt that residents are relieved spring has finally sprung. Even though today marks the end of winter, people are still bundled in their winter gear. The people we spoke with are overjoyed that the bitter cold days may finally be over, but they don't think we'll be smelling the flowers and mowing the lawn anytime soon. No, I'm excited for the changing of the seasons, uh, real excited for the steelhead run and everything that comes with spring and the kind of optimism that uh, exists with spring. I don't think we've, re we've got spring yet. I'm not sure when it's coming. Um, I'm not holding my breath. <laughs> We're going to have a short season this year again. I'm happy about the first day of spring. I'm happy about any day that looks like spring. Uh, it's been a long winter and uh, I look forward to getting outside more now. Spring is not here yet. There's still snow on the ground. It was snowing earlier today and it's still cold. Well, my thoughts on that are it's very welcome and it is warmer today than it has been, so I'm enjoying it. Enjoying it, yeah. As she mentioned, it's the first day of spring, uh, Kasia. I, I know we still got those four foot snow banks, but uh, hey, if they're cut down to say a foot by the first day of summer, it wouldn't <laughs> that wouldn't be too bad. 
<laughs> That's true. And today was beautiful, as you saw the streeters. We had spring-like conditions. Um, but that's pretty much where it's going to end. By tonight and tomorrow, we're back to the winter uh, conditions we've been getting used to. Uh, today, we had a high of plus one, plus two on average. And that is seasonal for this time of year. So that was the positive there. And um, mainly cloudy throughout the day. We had a wind chill this morning of minus 14. And as the day progressed, it averaged it to minus three and to no wind chill at all. And some pretty light winds gusting just between 7 to 18 kilometers an hour. Now, currently in the region, you can see we have pretty great conditions all across the board, uh, mainly sun and cloud throughout most of the areas. And it looks like most areas are, have, are hovering on the freezing mark, if not just above or below, with minus two in Uppsala, plus one in Atacokan, Dryden, and Red Lake. And for us tonight, the cloudiness will continue, and uh, we're going to have a low of minus 10, not much of a wind chill, just minus 12. And Winds coming in from the north at 11 kilometers an hour, but the cloudiness will end by tomorrow morning because you can see that snow accumulation is headed for our region. Uh, we should expect about 10 to 15 centimeters of snow by tomorrow, and the frigid cold temperatures are following right after. So well into next week and uh, this weekend, we can see snow and cold temperatures. But I'll have uh, more details for you later on in the news hour. Thanks, Kasia. Well, a possible new lead is serviced on that missing Malaysian jetliner. We have that story and more for you as your news hour continues. In the baffling mystery of the missing jetliner, the race to scour vast oceans for debris may lead to a breakthrough.
Well, for the last 13 days, the search for that missing Malaysia Airlines flight has left no stone unturned. Every piece of debris, every possible path is being explored. And today, another potential speck of hope. Johanna Rumliotis has the latest. In the baffling mystery of the missing jetliner, the race to scour vast oceans for debris may lead to a breakthrough. May. That is the caution already. We must keep this in mind. The task of locating these objects will be extremely difficult and it may turn out that they are not related to the search for flight MH370. Australia is leading the search after satellite images show two large objects bobbing 2,500 kilometres southwest of Perth. One, measuring about 27 metres long, could be part of the wing of the missing aircraft. But so far, military planes dispatched to find them have been hampered by bad visibility. This is a lead. It is probably the best lead we have right now. But we need to get there, find them, see them, assess them, to know whether it's really meaningful or not. And of caution again, they'll be difficult to find. Difficult because the sheer scope of the search area is daunting. Very, very remote in the uh, southwestern part of the uh, Indian Ocean, probably about 1,500 nautical miles to the southwest uh, of Perth. So uh, very remote um, and a very large, expansive area that we need to search. A Norwegian merchant ship kept searching into the night, but authorities caution the images are four days old. Any debris could have drifted far from the original site or sunk to the seabed. Even so, this could be a real lead. The debris may be within the southern arc investigators calculated the aircraft could have taken after it diverted from its original course. Still, Malaysian authorities stress the biggest mystery is still just that. For the families around the world, the one piece of information that we want most, that they want most, is the information we just don't have, the location of MH370. And in that void, many families still cling to hope. As a father, I still have to believe all the MH370 passengers are alive and well, he says. I hope they're in good health. Authorities say it will be at least two days before they know more about the mystery debris and come any closer to knowing what did happen to flight MH370. Joanna Vermiliotis, CBC News, Toronto. Despite new U.S. sanctions on allies of Russian President Vladimir Putin, despite the threat of more, today Russian lawmakers approved the annexation of Crimea. As now I add reports, some may embrace it, some are simply bracing for it. But either way, change is coming. Read closely and Crimea's quick transition stops cold for a moment at the fine print. Its largest bank shut down to bring in new rules and a new currency. And so a third of the population, now without access to money. A little panic maybe because we have money and we need to eat, to drink and to get to university for me. For supporters, Crimea's swift slide into Russia now slows with its bureaucracy. But for under $6, a Russian passport, when they finally get it, will be a touchable asset in a time of flux. <laughs> we believe in Russia. We believe in President Vladimir Putin, she says. We are grateful that they accepted us. But even as Crimea marches into the no-man's land between Ukraine and Russia, the U.S. president says there is time to back out. Russia still has a different path available, one that de-escalates the situation and, and one that involves Russia pursuing a diplomatic solution. But diplomacy takes time, and not everyone is willing to wait. Anxious Ukrainians like Alex Cherny leaving today with his entire family for good. We don't want to be Russian. We, we are not happy about what's going on. Nobody asks us. We know that uh, you can't really decide on, on things like that when the gun is pointing out at you, basically. A truce between Russians and Ukrainians here ends tomorrow. And with that may also be the end of most of what visibly remains here of Ukraine, including institutions and troops. For the people who stay, it is a transition that requires a strong will and a strong stomach. Nalayed, CBC News, Simferopol, Crimea. Alberta's progressive conservatives chose an interim leader today. Dave Hancock was deputy premier under Alison Redford until she resigned last evening. 
Hancock had been a strong Redford supporter, but as Breyer Stewart reports, he now has the job of putting back together a fractured caucus and turning the focus away from infighting and back to governing. An iconic part of Alberta politics under construction. And inside, another major work in progress underway. There's all, this business, every day is a difficult day. Uh, we, will, we will do the job that we were elected to do, that uh, this team is, has proven over and over again that it, that it does a good job at. Except the Tory dynasty is now without a permanent leader. That with a profound optimism for Alberta's future, I am resigning as Premier of Alberta, effective this Sunday evening. A disappointing end for a Premier who promised progress and change. And for the people who voted for her. It just, I just felt very sad. I felt sorry for her and I could see she was getting emotional, so am I. Andrea Varga is a lifelong Tory voter, but the party's track record is forcing her to reconsider. I was a good Stelmac supporter, being from Lamont, and they didn't treat him very dearly either towards the end, so they're just not very kind to their leaders. Former Premier Ed Stelmack was forced to step down because of infighting, and Ralph Klein bumped up his departure after a disappointing leadership review. But in Redford's case, the revolt was different. She was criticized for her spending and the use of government planes. Last week, the blows turned personal when she was called a bully. Okay, I'm going to turn this one loose. A big concern was what the PC party was hearing from voters. She wasn't connecting with many Albertans. I wasn't pleased with her as a leader. Bring back Ralph. That would be my, my uh, plan. Of course, that can't happen. The party does need a new leader, and the race to find one has already begun. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Edmonton. Two people have been killed in a serious fire in downtown Toronto early this morning. Firefighters were able to rescue 10 others, including children, from the crowded building. We thought we had one person up there to bring down. He said he saw nothing but eyes looking at him. Firefighters were clearly surprised by the number of people inside the building. Officials say they believe it was being used as a rooming house. The fire broke out overnight above a restaurant in the city's Kensington Market District. There is no word yet on the cause. And Quebec cardiologist Guy Turcotte will be retried in a Quebec court in the 2009 killings of his two young children. That's because the Supreme Court of Canada refused to hear the case. At his original murder trial in the deaths of his five-year-old son and three-year-old's daughter, Turcotte was found not criminally responsible. The prosecutors argued the jury should never have had that option. And the Quebec Court of Appeal ordered that Turcotte be retried. Well, the loonie is continuing its nosedive this week, dropping to levels not seen for half a decade. So how low can we expect it to go? And what does that mean for Canadian consumers? Aaron Saltzman has the story. For many, the biggest hit from the Canadian dollar's descent comes at the pump. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I didn't exactly choose the most uh, fuel-efficient car in the world to drive, so it, it hurts every day, all day. Short of downsizing your ride, there's not much anyone can do about the price of gas. The North American market is integrated. Wholesale gasoline is priced in U.S. dollars. When the loony drops, Canadian prices rise. Yeah, they've gone up, definitely. Since the start of the year, the Canadian dollar has fallen and fast, dropping from 94 cents U.S. to below 89 cents yesterday. If I had to drill down to what's really driving it in the last couple days, it's the very different tone we've seen from the Bank of Canada versus the Federal Reserve in, in the U.S. The U.S., he says, is hinting it may hike interest rates. Canada, worried about a weak economic outlook, may do just the opposite. It all adds up to a lower Canadian dollar, and that means just about anything that is imported will cost more. Sony is raising the price of its PlayStation 4 by 50 bucks because of the lower loony. Individual games and electronics in general will also cost more. Most clothing is made overseas, that too will become more expensive. Some retailers will be able to absorb higher costs, others not so much. Grocery is the perfect example of food where the margins are so thin that in fact if the price of the good is affected because of the currency, consumers will see uh, prices go up. 
cross-border shopping trips, that vacation in the U.S., both now less attractive. The loonie isn't expected to level off before the end of this year. So if you're heading south, maybe grab some greenbacks now. And if you're staying home, there's always that smaller car. Aaron Saltzman, CBC News, Toronto. A baby gorilla is on the mend after being diagnosed with pneumonia just a few days after she was born. Signs are normal and she looks fantastic. Sioux officials say the infant has improved enough to begin drinking formula from bottles and she's even beginning to breathe on her own. The baby, who is still nameless, is an endangered western lowland gorilla. The San Diego Safari Park is now home to eight gorillas. They're so cute and innocent when they're that small. Until they grow. Let's take a look on the markets. The TSX was up 27 points to 14,361. The Dow jumped 108 points to 16,331. And the Nasdaq posted an 11 point gain, closing at 43,19. The dollar was relatively steady at 88.95 cents US. Gold dropped $10 to $1,330 an ounce. And oil fell almost a dollar to drop to the $99 a barrel level. We're starting tonight uh, with spo in sports with a hockey announcement. Yeah, we want to say congratulations to uh, Thunder Bay's Trevor Latowski, uh, the current Sarnia Sting head coach. Uh, he'll be an assistant coach for the Candace under-18 men's hockey team. Oh, congratulations. And the head coach is Kevin Deneen, and he, of course, helped lead Canada to the gold medal, mm -hmm. the women's uh, gold medal in hockey at Sochi. Now to curling. <laughs> Did you know it's the final day of round robin play at the World Women's Curling Championships in St. John, New Brunswick? And Canada's Rachel Holman had to win this afternoon against China to avoid falling into a four way tie for first place. 
pick it up. 2-1 Canada, sixth inch. China skip. Si Ya Lu with a hammer and a shot at taking the lead. She'll try for the deuce with a double take up, but misses badly. So it's a steal of one for Canada as they go up three to one. Seventh and China won't miss fire at their next scoring chance. Using hammer to get the deuce as they use the Canadian stone here for backing. It is a draw for a couple, and we had a game tied up at three, but Holman breaks this one wide open. This is the turning point of the match in the eighth end, already lying three. She'll try for four, but she'll come up just a tad light in the eight foot. She will count three to end up winning this one six to four. Canada stays in first place at nine and one, and they can wrap up top spot and a berth in the one versus two playoff game with a win over Sweden tonight. If they lose, though, they could fall to the three versus four game. The Vancouver Canucks are now three points out of a playoff spot with 10 games to go after blanking Nashville 2-zip last night. Coach John Tortorella has told his team they need to play with urgency. Changes so quickly if you get a couple of points and, uh, and maybe get four points. We, we certainly, we, there's no question, we certainly need to get a streak going uh, or we're done. But let's just worry about starting one again here in Nashville and, and get this. I, and I do think after this game, they will have a day off, a much needed one with all the travel we had. Uh, and then we get ready for our Sunday game. But we need to worry about this. We can't look at getting a streak if you don't win the first one. But as far as the attitude of the team, right on through, and, and it's been a tough second half, it has. But right on through, they have come to work uh, and have had a good attitude and, and are just trying to get better. Do the players that... That, that have struggled and felt they needed to produce for us to win, sure, they felt it. But it wasn't wound tight. It was, it was just uh, uh, it, it was just the caring that they know they needed to be there. Nine games in the NHL tonight, including the surging Montreal Canadiens, chasing a fourth straight win at home to Columbus. Ottawa has to win at home against Tampa Bay to keep their playoff hopes alive. They're seven out. Minnesota is in New Jersey, and Edmonton welcomes Buffalo. Last night in Toronto, down a goal. The Leafs get it back. Carl Gunnarsson finds Phil Kessel. He'll slam his 35th goal past lightning tender. Ben Bishop tying it at one. Midway mark of the first, Nikolai Kuhleman. Masterful tip here on a Tim Gleason point shot for his ninth. Toronto takes the lead. Still in the first, Tampa ties it. Volteri Philpola, he'll go cross ice to Steven Stamkos, and he'll waste no time. One time in his 17th past James Reimer, the Wild. First period continues. Tyler Johnson digs it out to Stamkos. He'll waste no time. And it's 3-2 with his second of the game. In the second, a natural hat trick for the Scarborough native Stamkos. He'll bury an Eric Brewer rebound. And to make matters worse for the Leafs, not only do they lose the game, but Paul Ranger could be gone a while. He was hit from behind by Alex Kalorn. Tampa takes it 5-3. Other games, Winnipeg over Colorado in overtime, 5-4. Yeah, the Jets had to win sooner or later. They had lost 6 of 7. And uh, Chicago blank St. Louis for nothing. Better Bay North Stars nutminder Eric Mann has been named the SIJHL's top goalie this year. Wayne Strawn of Fort Francis is the coach of the year. And Markham is the place to be for the Clarkson Cup this weekend. It's the women's version of the Stanley Cup as the top teams in the Canadian Women's Hockey League compete for the championship. Rob Lath has more. If you want to see some championship hockey in the GTA this weekend, Markham is the place to be. I think it's huge. This is the pinnacle of it all. It's like raising the Stanley Cup, only it's like raising the Clarkson Cup. The Clarkson Cup goes to the champion of the Canadian Women's Hockey League, the four-team tournament playing for all the hardware at the Markham Centennial Centre. They have such a strong uh, grassroots program with the Markham uh, Stouffville Stars and uh, the community is so into hockey. It's, it's the perfect place to hold uh, the perfect week for the end of our season. The players still don't make any money playing the game they love, but it doesn't take away from their desire to win it all. Oh, it's going to be heated. It's going to get competitive. Um, obviously, the U.S. and Can Canadian rivalry anyways is pretty intense. It's the highest competition you can have, really. 
uh, a lot of Olympians are out there and it's great. With a memorable performance in Sochi still fresh in everybody's mind, the players are hoping to ride that momentum and eventually earn a paycheck. It's their passion. They have full-time jobs, but every day they, they train and they, they work hard for this because they love it. For the girls in attendance, it's a thrill seeing their idols up close and personal. It feels excited because it was like my first time like talking to one of them and then like they're using my fans and like they're taking pictures with us and it's really exciting. It feels awesome. Young fans dreaming of one day raising the Clarkson Cup. Rob Leff, Global News. The Toronto Raptors snapped the two-game skid last night in the Big Easy, topping New Orleans 107-100. DeMar DeRozan with a game-high 31. Kyle Lowry chips in with 23. Next up, back to the hangar tomorrow night to face Kevin Durant in Oklahoma City. Um, March Madness is tipped off. South of the border, 11 seed Dayton upset number six Ohio State 60-59. And uh, Wisconsin and Pittsburgh did as expected. They won their games. Well, uh, coming off a lackluster 1-1 draw with Chivas USA last weekend, the Vancouver Whitecaps will look for a more consistent effort when they take to the field this weekend in New England. Torres here. Torres with a shot deflected off to Merritt, and Chivas USA... Bad form, an unlucky bounce, and another letdown on the road. At least they can laugh about it now. Keeper David Osted joked that a bulkier Jay Demerit with a more prominent posterior might have made a difference in that one-all draw to Chivas. I might take him out for some cake later, but uh, we'll see. Jay's getting uh, a lot thinner, so uh, if he would have been a little bit bigger down there, uh, he wouldn't have gone in, but uh, no, it happens sometimes. Talk about a missed opportunity, because for the majority of the game, Chivas only had 10 men after an early red card. But the caps were flat, they lacked energy, a complete 180 on the road after that electrifying performance in the season opener. Kenny Miller is onside, and Kenny Miller with a... And we're not going to like, play amazing football and go and score three or four goals every game, but you just want to have a... I think even the work ethic of the team was down a little bit on Sunday, which which was, I'm sure, for the manager's point of view, was, was poor, because you would expect that to be a kind of a standard of every game. Once they got a man sent off, I think we, we took our foot off the pedal, and, and, and ultimately it should have been the other way. Uh, that, that was a time to, to, turn, to turn the screw and, uh, and get three good away points. One thing the Caps can take away other than the single point that they did manage is that Kakuta Mane continues to show great promise. He turned heads with a hat-trick performance late last season and sparked the late comeback against Chivas on Sunday. Back problems limited his preseason minutes, but he'll get more opportunity now that he's healthier. So we have a lot, a lot of quality players, uh, very technical players on the team, and uh, like I said, the, uh, the uh, spot is for a grab. Uh, anyone can uh, pick it up and uh, be on the side in 11. So it's been it's been really difficult. Even at practice, people fighting for their spot, and I think it's a good competition for the team. And in foul news, Arizona has signed former Jets cornerback Antonio Cromartie for one year. The Super Bowl champs from Seattle and former San Diego offensive lineman Steve Schilling. And Canadian defensive lineman Israel Adonaje is returning to the Chicago Bears after spending last year with Detroit. I live here in Chicago in the offseason. Everything I do off the field is based out of here, based out of Chicago. So when the opportunity got, connect, uh, got you know, started to connect to, uh, with the team, and we just kind of went, um, went down the road and, and, and uh, you know, Things uh, things end up uh, working out, so it's, it's it's good to be back one more year, and and um, you know I'm ready to to go to work, and believe me, there's lo there's lots of work to be done. And the Blue Jays, uh, <laughs> they won in Grapefruit League play today over Philadelphia 3-1. All right, uh, tonight we have comedy kicking off Global Thunder Bay tonight at eight o'clock with more. Here's Teletalk. Tonight on Global Thunder Bay, starting at eight on Growing Up Fisher. Mel and Joyce can't agree on how to discipline Katie. At 8.30 p.m. on the Millers, Nathan and Debbie both think the other has it easier at home. Then at 9 on Parenthood, old feelings of abandonment resurface when Joel forgets to pick up Victor. And at 10 on Hawaii 5 Steve tries to distract Danny while technicians deactivate a bomb. Over on CKPR Thunder Bay at 8, the nature of things has Canada like you've never seen it. At 9, explore Cuba's female sex tourism. Who's exploiting who on Love Under Cuban Skies? And at 11.35, George has a Muppet encounter as he sits down with Miss Piggy. Teletalk is brought to you by Points, the traffic ticket specialists.
the first day of spring cash are looking quite lovely. Unfortunately, the second day of spring, we could see some snow. That's right. Consider today kind of a tease because it's the last day for a while that we're going to see that is like spring-like conditions. We actually reached our seasonal temperature today of plus one, plus two. We saw a bit of snow this morning around eight or nine, but a very uh, light sprinkle and mainly cloudy otherwise throughout the day. The wind chill this morning, a minus 14, the temperature minus 10. And as the day progressed, it got warmer and warmer up to uh, minus three as the wind chill. Now, uh, there were um, special weather statements for the southern half of most provinces across the country today. Um, for BC, Alberta, and Saskatchewan, they got a snowfall warning in effect, about 10 to 15 centimeters of snow. But throughout the day, Vancouver had great conditions, uh, sunny skies, plus 8, and almost 10 degrees colder for Prince George with cloudy skies. Um, even colder than that, Edmonton at minus 7, and Calgary currently has some snow and at minus 3. Over in Saskatchewan, uh, Saskatoon and Regina, they're sitting on the freezing mark. Precipitation for both. And Winnipeg at plus two, a bit warmer, and some uh, cloud and precipitation over in Churchill. In southern Ontario, they have a uh, storm, uh, <laughs> snowstorm headed for them. They should get about 10 centimeters of snow. Um, but for right now, they're sitting at plus one, just cloudy skies. And some precipitation for both Ottawa and Quebec with some light flurries. In the Maritimes is where the messy conditions are. New Brunswick actually had a, quite a bit of uh, school closures today. They can reach up to 25 centimeters of snow today. And further south in the province, it's going to mix in with rain, as well as in PEI. They should get about 25 millimeters of rain by the end of today. Uh, Halifax at plus two, Charlottetown plus two as well, and just cloud right now. And in St. John's, they're going to get snow as well, about 10 centimeters and a uh, temperature of minus three right now. Looking at the system across, you can see that snow did go across the, the prairies and into our region by tomorrow. It will hit us around eight or 10 in the morning is when we can expect it. And then going into Saturday, it should completely leave our region uh, by the end of the weekend. And you can see the high pressure system is following, so we're gonna get even colder temperatures on Saturday. Uh, for tonight across the region, precipitation will start already on the west side of the, uh, of the region. Dryden at minus eight, uh, similar temperature in Atacokan, uh, sorry, Atacokan minus eight, uh, Dryden minus six. Much colder in Big Trout Lake at minus 19. And heading east, they don't, they're not gonna get precipitation just yet in Greenstone, minus 12. Sault Ste. Marie, minus 13, but going into tomorrow, looks like the precipitation will catch up with them, but pretty great condition, uh, temperature sitting on the freezing mark. Uh, sun and cloud for Sault Ste. Marie, and the snow will continue over in the east area, uh, west area. Uh, currently right now, we've got great conditions. It's just cloudy right now, the high today of plus one, and no wind chill. It's very light, and going into... Tonight, it will be minus 10, hardly any wind chill, and cloudy conditions up until tomorrow morning. Um, that's when we're going to see that snowfall of 5 to 10 centimeters throughout the day and could continue into Saturday. Uh, temperature of minus 6 when you're heading out and very light winds gusting up to 10 kilometers an hour. Now, looking at the extended forecast, you can see that it doesn't look like spring-like conditions like we said. Tomorrow, we've got a high of 0 a low of minus 12, that snow is going to reach up to 10 centimeters at most. And it could possibly go into Saturday, but should t completely taper off then with a high of minus 4 and a low of minus 17. Sunday, temperatures are going to drop, and you can see that's going to be pretty persistent consistent throughout the week, a high of just minus five, some sun, which is nice, and then Monday looks like we might get those flurries once again. And Tuesday, back to uh, sunny skies, and it should be sunny for the following for the rest of the week. You can see our lows are almost hitting minus 20, and according to Environment Canada, we can expect that uh, well into next week and even throughout April. So it doesn't look like it's quite ready to uh, bring out your spring jackets just yet. It's time for this week's visit to the local Humane Society. Tonight, Fiona Gardner is introducing us to a three-year-old cat who has a very appropriate name for the first day of spring. Here's Tulip. Hi, this week's Humane Society Pet of the Week is a very pretty, cuddly little girl named Tulip, who is a three-year-old domestic medium hare. This girl is all about love and affection, but unfortunately she was surrendered to the Humane Society because her owner couldn't take care of her anymore. 
So now she's looking for a new home and I gotta tell you, this girl will fit in anywhere. She loves to play and she loves to cuddle and she loves to explore. If uh, you have a home that has room for one more, we'll drop by the Humane Society and meet Tulip today. Your Pet of the Week has been brought to you by Thunder Pet, expert advice and high quality pet food within your budget. Well, as we are bracing for some more snow, people in Colorado are dealing with another problem, too many tumbleweeds. Stay with us. A huge amount of tumbleweeds in Colorado are giving some residents a whole lot of trouble. These tumbleweeds have been piling up against houses and cars. And residents say it's even made driving difficult because there are so many on the road. The problem is so bad, this county plans to use snow plows to try to clear them away. Can you imagine opening your door and there's a massive tumble tumbleweed and not snow? It could be worse, it could be cactus, those things hurt. <laughs> Yes. Take it from me, first-hand experience. Not supposed to touch them. I know, you're not supposed to back into them, but <laughs> you live and learn. Yeah, okay. We're going to recap our top story. Well, it looks like the James Street Swing Bridge may soon see new repairs as workers were on the site of the uh, part of the bridge that's been the most damaged from the flames, and they're setting up scaffolding. 
And a huge game at the World Women's Curling Championships tonight in New Brunswick. Canada's Rachel Homan can lock up a berth into the one versus two page playoff game. All she has to do is beat Sweden. If she doesn't, she could end up in the three versus four game. We'll have highlights later. And today is pretty much the only spring-like day for quite a while. Uh, we can expect up to 10 centimeters of snow for tomorrow, but a high of zero, so not too bad. And that's your early look at news, weather, and sports. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Have a great night.